Hello and welcome back to Continental Club where we discuss the hottest topics in European football. On the agenda today we are talking bargains. So I brought two of the cheapest men in football daily. Cheap shot, Chris Hamill this comes from a Scott. Pato. Yeah, true. True, a fake Scott though. Yeah, exactly. Uh, first question comes from Tamish Bahal. Can Bruno Fernandes prove to be a bargain at £31 million? But before we dive into bargains, please, if you're new to the channel, remember to subscribe to it and hit that notification bell to never miss a video. But let's give a bit of background to Bruno Fernandes because according to Sky Sports, his agent has flown over this week to finally sort of put the finishing touches to that move to Old Trafford. He basically signed a five-year contract last summer and supposedly we're hearing this week that there was a £31 million release clause inserted into it. Sky are also reporting that if uh, someone offers to pay Sporting that much and uh, they refuse, then he's due a £5.4 million payment himself. Um, so that's going to be pretty interesting. Fernando Verendez, the sporting president, says... Uh, he hopes it will be the most expensive sale in their history, which at the moment is Jao Mario to Inter Milan for £36 million. So it seems like Bruno Fernandes could be going for a lot cheaper than we initially thought, Chris. <coughs> and do you think this could potentially be a good deal for Man United? Yeah, I mean, we're playing a bit fast and loose with the word bargain here, aren't we? It's probably a bargain in comparison to the prices that were banded around before, and they wanted mm. mega money for mm. him, didn't they? Post 100 million euros we were hearing at the end of last campaign, uh, a lot of that, I, I think, was to recoup you know, some of the fees they lost for other players on freeze owing to the big uh, scandal the year before. Um, but to give you a little bit of background on Bruno Fernandes, um, I mean, people have their reservations plucking players out of Portugal because it's not necessarily the most challenging domestic scene, but he has done the rounds and he has prospered in other leagues as well. We've covered him on podcasts, but let's just revisit some of the key points here um, because he actually came through the academy at Navarro, so in sporting, before moving to Udinese in 2013, aged 18. There as a bright-eyed teenager, made 86 Serie A appearances, scoring 11 and assisting 11 before moving on to Sampdoria, for the princely sum of £5.4 million in August 2016. And then he had one really productive season there. Five goals, two assists in 34 games. Expected goals actually put that closer to nine goal contributions. So he was one of the standout players in that Samp side. And uh, he returned to Sporting subsequently in a really weird deal because it was around that time that you'd imagine you know, other clubs, other suitors would have been in for him. Mm. But he's returned to Portugal for £8.7 million. And what a signing he's been since. So, uh, 33 league games last season, 20 goals and 13 assists. Of course, breaking Frank Lampard's long-standing record as the most goal contributions in a single domestic campaign. Although, you know, the Premier League does... Uh, Liga Nash doesn't really stand up to the Premier League, does it? 3.7 shots, 3.2 key passes, 0.9 dribbles per 90 tended to play as a number 10 or a bit of an attacking, uh, attack-minded 8. And United could really use midfield reinforcements. I'm not necessarily saying that Bruno Fernandes is that player, but they are starting the season with Mitomany, Pereira, uh, Fred and Matic. Um, seven goal contributions between them, having lost Herrera to PSG and Fellaini to China. Uh, and I suppose Bruno Fernandes, he did make a decent defensive uh, contribution last season. I think it was 2.1 tackles and interceptions. Um, and it sounds like they need a midfielder who can, you know, be a jack of all trades. I mean, they've got Pogba, who is literally that, isn't it? But it's whether they want to free Pogba up uh, and for him to become more of a, a progressive player in that side or, or whether they want to kind of keep him shackled as the deep-lying playmaker, um, where he doesn't seem all that comfortable, well mm. he is comfortable playing there but he doesn't necessarily want to play there. I've seen a lot of interviews where he said I want to play attacking midfield, I want to play further up the pitch and this kind of clashes with that vision for Pogba. So it's not the most obvious sign in my, in my opinion, I think he's for £31 million I think it's a fair price um, and I think he probably would have a positive impact. I mean he could play in a midfield three as well in a 4-3-3, three, three. he's done that for Sporting Lisbon before as well. Um, but it's not I wouldn't say it's inspiring business. Do you see him making a, a massive impact, Pato, at Manchester United? Do you think this is the player they should be pursuing right now? Not really. I mean, I agree with you that like what what he's good at, he's good at, right? Like, and 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 the price feels kind of fair-ish. And I remember a couple of years ago, just before he went to Sporting, we said he'd be actually a really good backup for Ericsson at Spurs, or maybe a good ten for Everton. 
uh, because he went for about eight mil or something. Mm. It was a pittance, really. Um, yeah, it just seems like you're if you give him the ball in the attacking third, you're taking it away from Pogba. And yeah, I think that that's not the right the right thing to do. For me here, the issue is opportunity cost. It's not that oh, is Br Bruno Fernandez is is terrible or he's not worth thirty mil, uh, though I wouldn't pay it. It's more that I think if I had 30 mil and I'm Man United, I can just do better for what they need. Like, go and get Santiago Caceres out of Villarreal, go and get Ibrahim Songere, go and get Schlager, who's just gone to Wolfsburg out of the Austrian Bundesliga, uh, get Florian Grilich off Hoffenheim. Like, these are really, really good defensive minded players who can also do some ball progression mm -hmm. and they're going to free Pogba up. Fernandez is going to restrict Pogba, if anything, like Chris has said. And I just think. United have a lot of money, but they don't have unlimited money, mm. you know, and they also don't have unlimited places in the squad and they also don't have unlimited wages because the Premier League limits wages. It's not just down to what Man United are willing to pay. And so when you spend a bunch of money on Bruno Fernandes, you can't spend it on someone else. And to me, if they went and spent this money on Songere, that would actually be a much smarter move for the yeah. future of the club. I was going to say, he's probably the outstanding candidate, the names you just listed for me. He's good. Like, and apparently he's available for £21 million. Pounds. Mm. I'm not sure why the top sort of 10 teams in the Premier League aren't fighting for a signature for that sort of fee as well because decent chance creation as well as massive defensive numbers he's literally a really good two-way midfielder that's you know slightly more inclined on the de defensive side but yeah 21 mil I mean Amadou Diawara let's talk about him he's just moved for 18 million pounds to, mm. to Roma from from Napoli that seems like an extremely fair price you know m more in line with the question I suppose about bargain signings he didn't rack up an awful lot of minutes over his three campaigns in Naples did he but whenever he was given the chance he always put up very good numbers yeah I think it was about I think he played about 2,300 minutes across his three campaigns which is pretty demoralizing for him and about 45 percent of those came in his first campaign I think last year it was about 600 60 minutes or so, big defensive output, can progress the ball but still only 21, um, but really made his name at Bologna before that move yeah. uh, and absolutely smashed it as an 18 year old at Bologna, mm. sort of close to five tackles and interceptions, like over a dribble a game, just looked really, really impressive. So it'll be interesting to see what he can do at Roma and it's going to be a fact, I think Roma could be fascinating next year. Um, they've obviously lost Luca Pellegrini to Juventus, bringing in Spinazzola and I was listening to a podcast yesterday talking about Paolo Fonseca and apparently his Shakhtar team was just so exciting to watch. I know they've got such an easy ride in the Euro Ukrainian Premier League, but in the Champions League, they've made massive progress over the mm. last few years, really challenging some top teams. And apparently he loves to bomb his fullbacks forward, and Spinazzola could suit that quite well. Um, they've obviously brought in Brian Cristante permanently as well. He made that loan move from At Atalanta permanent That's as well. Good signing. Um, so it, things like, things like, look, it looks like things are improving at Roma. The big thing they need to sort out is Dzeko and his future because he was pretty unhappy at times last year and it seems like that might be coming towards an end. It seems like Inter Milan seem to be sniffing around there as well but I'm not quite sure why they're getting in Lukaku, Dzeko and there's no rumours about um, Akadi leaving so I'm not quite sure what's going mm. on there. Um, but Pat, of the done deals, uh, you know, we've talked about Amadou Diawara there but have there been any others that have impressed you on the continent? Uh, I like Moussa Diaby to buy a Leverkusen, like obviously they needed reinforcements, they've brought in Kerem Demo by as well who's mm. a fantastic player but I think they probably paid about market rate. 28, yeah. Yeah, um, that's a really good price for him, it's, it's exactly what you'd expect to get for him if you were Hoffenheim. Um, but Moussa Diaby coming out of PSG was actually quite a central player for them last season for a 19 year old winger I mean he got about 1100 1200 minutes which for a kid of that age is surprising and I'm kind of alarmed that they let him go really eight goals and assists in the league um, and I think he was second among under 23s in Europe for expected goals assisted per 90 wow, okay. and those are sorts of numbers that tend to pop a bit later on mm. like you often see players get lots of shots get lots of dribbles but you often you quite rarely see them be good creators. And I think it goes Leroy Sane, Moussa Diaby, and then Alex Awobi as the top under 23 creators in Europe. Great company. Good company. Um, mm. so, so yeah, I think that he's a pretty versatile solution for them. And normally you pay a premium for a guy coming out of a big club like that, but I think they've paid 15 million euros and that mm. to me seems like a very sensible move. I think they're mm. taking advantage of the fact that a little bit like Marseille, PSG have to generate some quick funds, don't they, in order to meet FFP yeah, that's true. Uh, regulations. So there is the kind, Celtic did it with Alton Edward last campaign, eight million pounds, and, and PSG aren't aren't negotiating <laughs> necessarily because uh, of said FFP. Um, I, I really like the Rauder Thomas transfer um, from Real Madrid to Benfica. 
I think it's going to suit both parties. He had a really good time of it at Real Vallecano last season. Yeah, a really yeah. shot shy Real Vallecano as well. Mm. I think they're in the bottom five uh, for shots generated. And he was carving out in himself around two opportunities in the box. I think maybe nearing three shots in total, which is, again, given the circumstances, um, very good. He's a bit of a one-man band, I think 14 goals. And I think at one point he was the highest scoring Spaniard in La Liga. Um, so <coughs> he'll go to he'll go to Benfica. He could score a bunch of goals there. We've seen it with, you know, uh, Seferovic. We've seen it with Jonas. With Benfica strikers <laughs> tend to fare uh, extremely well, well, particularly yeah. if they've if they've done you know half decent in another league. Um, so I can see him having a real prosperous kind of year, two years, and then potentially moving on again and earning Benfica a little bit of money because around that price point, it's a real. It's not steel, but yeah. it's very sensible business from Benfica. Yeah. Uh, Alexander Isaac as well, uh, moving to Sociedad. Yep. Uh, I'm hearing seven, uh, between seven and ten million pounds. Of course, they're sniffing around Odegaard as well. If they can bring both of them in, that would be exceptional business. Bringing in two two young players who, you know, well, one's obviously come out of the Dortmund academy, the, the other Dortmund are kind of s sniffing around as well. Um, it looks like Odegaard is going to go to Leverkusen. I, th I think that's probably the sensible choice, him playing Champions League football, but they're still in the conversation. Uh, Alex Alexander Isaac, though, scoring 14 and 18 appearances for Villem too. Uh, I, I thought there'd have been more teams in for his signature as well, um, but his, his star's kind of taken a bit of a a bit of a bruising. That's not really a saying, is it? But um, owing to the whole Dortmund situation. Mm. Uh, and Breland Bola, I'm seeing he, he's moved on as well. Yeah, he's gone to Gladbach, didn't really pan out for him, did it? No, it didn't. And I, I remember doing Schalke on the podcast a couple of months ago. And he was one of the players that I was saying needs more game time, could base a team around. Because when he's played, he's looked really impressive. He's, I think he's still 21. Um, but over two mm. shots a game, two dribbles, really good. Um, on a horrible side goals, well. And then a really not very good side. So it'll be really interesting to see what... Gladbach do next year under Marco Rosen. They've obviously lost Torgan Hazard as well. But my sort of, it's not really a bargain, but long term, I think it will prove to be one of the best pieces of business in this window, has got to be Delict going to Juventus for, I think it's going to be under 60 million, which is just incredible when the fee that people were talking about was closer to 90 or 100 a couple of months ago. And, you know, Juventus bringing in Rabio, Ramsey, Delict, obviously, Spinazzola. It's just. Um, they, they've absolutely killed it, um, this window. Just incredible. Do you think um, the conversation uh, around the fee, do you think the fee's come down as a, you know, as the conversation about wages has raged on and people, you know, have been offering him stupid 300 to 350k a week, do you think that's had an adverse effect on the fee that Ajax are going to get? <laughs> because it's yeah. maybe may scared off some of the other teams. But, like, I'm, I'm thinking how they could have possibly negotiated this down. To, it's going to be 50 plus add-ons, right? You imagine yeah. they're pretty significant add-ons that might take it to mid-60s, which again feels feels like a fair price. Um, but you also wouldn't really bat an eyelid if Ajax got 80 to 90, like you're saying. But but the fact that, um, what's, what's his name? What's his chops? Latan's agent, Mina, Mina Raiola, the old, the old shades. Yeah, I think, I think demands of 350K for a 19 year old might have had, might have had a, an adverse effect there. Yeah, I realise I said Spinazzola when I meant Luca Pellegrini as well, just to we clarify know, that. We know what you meant. But uh, yeah, I just think, you know, he's, he's already got 110 appearances for Ajax. He's the future of that uh, Netherlands defence. I just think it will be one of the deals that we look back in five, six years' time and just think that was incredible business, especially with the need to do it at centre-half, with Bonucci and Chiellini ageing out and their backup last year really underperformed. Um, Pat, what have you made of... Because one deal that sort of took my eye was Munas de Boer moving to Sevilla mm -hmm. for a relatively cheap fee. Do you think that deal could work out quite well? Because we're hearing Ben Yedder might be on the move this summer as well. So it's a bit of a transfer merry-go-round of Sevilla strikers. Oh, I think it's just a sensible gamble. Like, uh, he's coming out of the Austrian Bundesliga and he's been there uh, for a long time. Um, so you, you're never quite sure what you're going to get. Um, but he's been an extremely reliable scorer there, and generally speaking, they produce pretty good talent. I mean, obviously, he's not terribly young, but the last couple of seasons has hit more than 20 goals in the league, and he did it, he did it before that as well. So I think um, uh, it's just a very severe move. Like Sevilla have actually brought in a load of guys already. Mm. You know, they've brought in a centre back from Bordeaux, Kunde. They've brought in Dabur. Uh, I think they've got they've got quite a few people through the door. So I think Sevilla's plan always is we will take five or six gambles at eight to 10 million and just share the responsibility around. Um, whether he ends up being a star in the way that Ben Yedder was, I don't know, because Ben Yedder was undervalued in Ligue 1 for years and nearly went to Arsenal. So yeah, it just seems sensible. But Sevilla, 
it does feel like they're going to take a big step back losing Sarabia. Yeah, I mean, I was just about to say, Sarabia to uh, PSG for 16 million, I think it was in the end. Incredible bit of business. Um, always a bit of a shame when I think a player like Sarabia joins PSG. Yeah. I don't know, I'm always just a bit disappointed. I find it really underwhelming, but I actually think it's it could be a more positive step than we're perhaps giving Sarabia and Tuchel and PSG credit for, because now they've got these guys that are going to be snapping at the heels of the superstars. You know, guys who can come up with the goods and not necessarily come with the baggage, come yeah. with the, the high profile name and people like Sarabia. I mean, he was talk about undervalued, like the consistency that that guy's brought to that Sevilla side, even as they've ebbed and flowed, uh, it has been has been brilliant. So I th think he feels more like a Tuchel player. He might get more minutes than, than we anticipate. Um, and you know, if Neymar moves at the end of this window, then it will probably be the greatest window of all time. So, hundred percent, hundred percent. One name to finally throw in there: Teji Savanier has moved from Nîmes to Montpellier. Had a fantastic year at Nîmes last year. I think it was six goals, fourteen assists. So, watch out for him at Montpellier. But yeah, that's our roundup of the bargains of the window so far. But we are aware that Europe goes on until about the 31st of August, unlike the Premier League, so there's plenty more time. But let us know in the comments below which you guys think has been the bargain so far, and let's move on to quickfire questions. First quickfire question comes in from at Boss Wilson, regular contributor. Thank you very much, Boss or Ross. Uh, which of the top five leagues is most likely to have a new winner? So not City, Barca, Bayern, PSG or Juve. Pato, what do you think? <laughs> wow. Surprise package. Oh... God, uh, probably, maybe Syria, mm, maybe I Syria. Uh, PSG, like, I, I don't know. When I look around the others, it's extremely hard to see anybody getting that close. Like, Liverpool, I think, will be good, but they'll still probably take a bit of a step back and City will be stronger. Um, yeah, I don't know. Like, the, the only hope for Syria, I think, is that Napoli get Hamas Rodriguez, which is a step up. They, they get in a couple of good signings and that Juve take a year to develop, a year where they're kind of phasing out some of their older guys, bringing in some of the younger guys, getting Romero and De Ligt in for Chiellini and Bonucci, you know, and Sarri's system is sort of working out. So maybe there's a possibility for Napoli to sneak a title mm. there. I think Napoli, well, one needs to keep hold of Fabian Ruiz. I suppose that's less of an issue if you bring James Rodriguez in. Obviously, he's been linked to Real Madrid as well, hasn't he? Brilliant playmaker last season for them. Um, and also uh, a centre-half. They need to. Raul Albiol has gone to Villarreal, hasn't he? He's Manolas is long standing yeah, serving. Costas Manolas, of course. Uh, and then I suppose Koulibaly is still a very good age. Well, he's still t 28, 29, right? So mm. still a good age. Uh, who are their full backs at the moment? Haysaj? They've got Gulam and, Ra and Rui on the left, but they're linked with Kieran Tierney on the right. They've got Hussai, and I'm not sure. I'd right. see Kieran Tierney going oh, to that. I'd love that. The Kappa kit, Tierney on the back. Magio, you maybe. wouldn't be able to get me out of it. Uh, I'd sleep in it. Um, okay, an another winner. I mean, I was also thinking Serie A, but okay, maybe the Premier League, Liverpool, if they were to sign someone like Nicola Pepe, if they mm. if they made another kind of meaningful, two meaningful signings, of course, Manchester City signing Rodri uh, is a is a big signal of intent, isn't it? <laughs> They've effectively gone out and, and bought in the guy who could replace Fernandinho, like the best replacement for him, I think, uh, that's currently available. Uh, so really tough question, but. Yeah, let's hope Liverpool can, can push. Yeah. I, th I just think they played close to their capacity in the 38 game season last year, Liverpool, where it felt like City dropped a lot of points where they, they could have won, particularly in that sort of January period. I just can't see Liverpool. And the injuries were in their favour as yeah, well. Yeah, I just can't see yeah. Liverpool winning, the, winning a league in a 38 game season. They'll still be you know, heavily competing and up there for the Cups. Maybe the Bundesliga, just to be different. Um, <laughs> But I, no chance. Have you I'm, seen the summer that Bayern have had? No, I'm not totally <laughs> convinced by Kovac though, and I still think they need some attacking reinforcements yeah, as well. Yeah, the forwards are thin. Yeah, exactly. So, I don't know. But I'd expect someone to come in there yeah. uh, before the window is done. Imagine and if they sign Leroy Sane. That was so Dortmund good. and Leipzig will be threats. But yeah, I probably agree with Pat. I think it's probably in Serie A. Let's move on to our next one. Uh, who do you guys think will be the dark horses in the Champions League in 1920? Just while these guys think, and that was a no Nobels question, uh, one, two, three. Um, I like the sound of Benfica. I have to admit, I haven't watched them that often. But I remember Ajax and I remember I Eric Ten Hag saying that they were their toughest opponents last year in the Champions League when they played them in the group stages twice. Um, they've oh, obviously it, lost it Jao. Wasn't, wasn't that just a dig at that round? I agree, it might have been. <laughs> um, but they've lost, obviously, Jao Felix, but they've already started, you know, cleverly reinvesting. Um, and really, you know, exciting attacking talents, the likes of Rafa on the left. Um, yeah, I think. Benfica for a dark horse, an actual dark horse shout, would be quite interesting, maybe for a quarter-final slot at most. Um, you guys? 
a dark horse for a quarter final slot. I'll, yeah, I'm not I'll, saying I mean, for a good, winner. Good, good caveat that because I was going to say Benfica. Yeah, I again like I think Benfica and Porto do really really well to get to the last sixteen sort of mm. every other year, don't they? I, I think you know they give a lot of hope to to you know clubs like Celtic. <laughs> <laughs> you, you can punch you know above your weight. Um, when does your campaign start? Uh, this week. It, yeah, the qualifiers. The yeah. is it we we we're coming in at the, like the the second. The second round, maybe, oh, yeah. Uh, but yeah, we have to pay, uh, play at least three qualifiers, um, and then there's a playoff actually as well. Yes, it's, 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 I think it's the fifth or sixth. Long ways to go. Or, okay. Around then, uh, dark horses. Okay. Um, wow. Well, have you got an answer for this? While I kind of m stumble around, uh, it's difficult because yeah, a lot of clubs just aren't dark horses now. Like Spurs. Spurs. I said dark horses last year. Spurs are not really dark horses after getting to a Champions League final. Uh, Leipzig definitely. Like Leipzig have got a ton of talent and a great new coach, and if they keep Werner, there they'll be a weapon. Um, uh, and I'd love it to be Atalanta. Mm. I would be delighted if Atalanta could go deep. And to be honest, Atalanta's attack is good enough to get through anyone. Mm. They're a genuinely good side. Right, so that would be fun. Maybe Leon, if, if Leon kind of reinvest the fellow Mendy uh, slash, you know, if Nabil Fakir, if, if they keep Fakir and they keep Depay, uh, and and obviously. Who's their end on better replacement? They're signing from Lille. Oh, Thiago Mendes. Thiago, yeah. Thiago Mendes. If, if they, He's a very good player. If they keep reinvesting well um, and keep hold of some of their key players, I can see them having another season of pushing the top, top teams um, to their to their maximum capacity because we saw how good they were against Manchester City. Um, so perhaps, perhaps their domestic form wasn't a true representation of the talent kind of in that squad and in the Champions League campaign was more so. But yeah, Leon maybe. Yeah. My another outside shot into Milan under Conte. I think that'd be really tough to beat, and they're still strengthening heavily before the window closes. But that's all we've got time for on Concerns of Club for this week. Thank you very much for watching. Let us know as ever your thoughts down below uh, or on Twitter on these handles. Um, Chris, what should they go and do now? I think they should go over to Squad Goals, our new channel. It's FDFC rebranded and check out the latest episode of Squad Goals. And I think there's a new awkward FIFA in the pipeline as well. But go and watch, you know, John Babs and Patrick's if you haven't watched them before. Uh, anything else, Pat? Mm, uh, Olivia Dodd's podcast, yeah. The Game's Gone Mad, will be available for download, I think, by the time this goes out. So check that out with Pete Dorman, who's back from his holidays. And we nice. actually did an Extra Time podcast as well that's going out we this did that too. Sunday, Oh, brilliant. So. We'll go, go and watch that and two days time and uh, yeah go check out yesterday's hot takes me and Joe had a debate about the best under 21 players in the world um, but yeah thank you very much for watching guys and we'll see you next time bye, bye.